that is consistent across, uh, again, many studies are over 20 studies, and all the data are in exactly the same range. So these background levels here that they found prior to treatment indicate that in addition to dental sealants, there are six billion plus pounds of bisphenol A made a year. They're in microwavable, say, food containers, which is a joke. Don't ever do that. Don't ever take plastic and put it in the microwave. Uh, baby bottles are made from this stuff, which is getting a lot of attention. Uh, Tupperware, uh, it, the lining of cans in the United States is made from the resin, uh, bisphenol A-based resin. So there are many sources. And in fact, this background level is clearly not due to dental sealants. Okay, that the background level is clearly, uh, uh, pretty clearly due to food sources. And that's because the Japanese got kind of irritated about the fact that there was a lot of publicity over bisphenol A coming out of cans in Japan. And about seven or eight years ago, the Japanese can industry very quietly removed bisphenol A as the lining of cans. And there's evidence that the blood levels of bisphenol A in the Japanese population very quickly dropped down about 50%. Sort of like taking lead out of gasoline. Dramatic effect on blood lead levels in the United States. So there are ways to reduce this background level, which is at pretty high levels in the United States. And you can see, giving these two types of sealant, there was a different amount of detection. These are on spot urine uh, samples, you know, just single urine collection. And both of them, within an hour, were releasing some bisphenol A. But by a day later, the heliocele is down back to baseline levels. So certainly in an adult, a very transient increase in uh, bisphenol A in, in the body, it's hard to see that causing a long-term effect. On the other hand, we don't know enough about the ability of children to respond to these pulses by showing some type of change in tissue development. But clearly, here's a situation with this particular dental sealant where even 24 hour later, you're uh, over threefold above baseline. So this, there's no doubt from animal research that that type of acute manipulation is capable of altering permanently the functioning of tissues in animals exposed to these types of increases in bisphenol A. There are adverse health consequences associated with that. So in that, there are different types of sealants in use, some of which give you only a very transient rise, and others give you a much more prolonged rise the CDC con uh, you know, conclusion and everybody's conclusion would be, let's not use these types of sealants. Let's try to go to sealants that give you the greatest amount of uh, uh, rapidity of clearance. And then a paper came out recently saying from Japanese group that if after administration of the sealant, there was considerable gargling and spitting out of the uh, uh, saliva, that uh, this would greatly reduce the uh, accumulation in the body of this. So even this level, if with extensive gargling based on this uh, research, would suggest that you could reduce the, even the acute exposure with some of these uh, more stable uh, compounds. So I think the initial arguments about are there different levels of bisphenol A that come out of different sealants, how much come out, I really think we're beyond that. That some of the products out there that have higher rate of release need to be identified and uh, they should be replaced with products that give you the lowest possibility of exposure, particularly when you're doing this in children. If you think about the last set of data in the part per billion, when you administer 25 micrograms per kilogram to, per day to a pregnant mouse, these are the levels you find over the next 24 hours in the mouse fetus. 
they drop pretty rapidly in the mother. Now remember, the human has 10 times higher than this amount in his or her blood, and that's the average person anywhere in the world. That suggests that people, if they have anywhere similar to the metabolism of this relative to animals, and the American Chemistry Council say people metabolize it faster, okay, which suggests we would have to, um, you know, in humans be exposed to even, you know, substantially higher than maybe 250 to 300 micrograms per kilogram per day uh, in order to achieve the blood levels that we have in humans. What is important about that is the FDA and EPA currently state that 50 micrograms per kilogram per day is a safe amount. But based on the levels being detected in human blood around the world, there is very little doubt that daily human exposure to this chemical is substantially above uh, the, what would be declared even now based on totally flawed methodology, a safe daily exposure level. So anything that the dental community can do to reduce that level by using types of sealants that don't add to that body burden uh, is uh, a, a contribution. What are so I thought what I'd do is very quickly take you through some of the health consequences. Because one thing for me to say, oh yeah, there are health consequences. So I thought I'd say these are all published studies from doses of bisphenol A that are below this level that would give you, if you gave 25 micrograms per kilogram per day, you would put into the body of a developing mouse about a tenth of what is in the average human. Okay, just remember that as a reference. Here's two micrograms per kilogram per day. That's gonna give you about 100 times lower than what's present in the human. Lo and behold, what it does is it permanently suppresses the ability of the testy in rats to make testosterone. Not a good idea. It's not surprising that what you see as a consequence of that, and we published this a number of years ago, that within this dose range, you see an inhib permanent inhibition of the testy uh, in developing male to make sperm. Not such a great deal if you're a guy. And the other thing we published that we're spending a lot of time on and this is, might confuse you a little bit, this is the urethra, and this is the developing prostate from a newborn mouse, and these are the prostate glands emerging out of the urethra, and this is where the urethra enters the bladder. And one of the stunning things that we saw in, uh, oh, I have unpublished, we published this in Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences. It's kind of an old figure, I didn't realize that is that it takes the bladder neck and it squeezes it, and these, end up, these animals end up with bladder outlet obstruction disease. It is really terrible what they look like in adulthood. And, uh, and they also end up with prostate cancer. And right at the beginning of life, we see a dramatic hyperplasia going on in the prostate ducts, and this occurs with DES, with the drug in birth control pills, the thionylestradiol, or with bisphenol A. They all do exactly the same thing. And again, these are at exceedingly low doses. And these effects are permanent. Uh, and in the female side, these are female mouse pregnant mothers that are given 20 micrograms per kilogram per day bisphenol A. And these are chromosomes in the developing oocyte. And the oocyte is different than the sperm in that it starts to undergo development and uh, enters meiosis, uh, the phase of reduction division uh, in the embryo. And as it does that, the chromosomes start misaligning. And you see them lining up end to end rather than side by side. And this is associated in humans and in other species with uh, the development when they finally ovulate and are fertilized with uh, aneuploid, that is non-normal disjunction of chromosomes, things like Down syndrome and embryonic death. So this occurs during the early phase of oocyte development and then when 
the final phase of oocyte development occurs during the cycle associated with the mid-cycle surge in luteinizing hormone, uh, and you reinitiate meiosis, you have to have a dividing of chromosomes normally. And if it, bisphenol A is just, if the mice were drinking from a polycarbonate bottle and getting very low amounts, low microgram per kilogram per day amounts of bisphenol A, it looks like somebody took a shotgun and just blew the chromosomes all over the cell. And uh, lo and behold, there's a decrease in fertility in the mice as a result of this. And the Japanese followed up on this, and they found that women who repeatedly miscarried had um, about threefold higher levels of bisphenol A in their blood relative to women who had normal pregnancies. So this basically says to a woman, exposure to bisphenol A any time in your life has the potential to disrupt the functioning of oocytes in your ovaries, causing chromosomal damage. Because the geneticists who study this in mice uh, are convinced that the basic processes of alignment of the chromosome in women and mice is fundamentally similar. And this is mammary gland development at 2,000 times below what is currently this supposed safe dose of 50 micrograms per kilogram per day. Here's a normal mouse mammary gland if a doctor ever saw this, uh, he'd be really concerned because you have this massive proliferation and increase in uh, uh, terminal end buds where the cancer occurs. And lo and behold, these mice go on to form mammary cancer um, uh, as predicted from that study. So you have mammary cancers, prostate cancers, low sperm count, all kinds of things. Well, what about the brain? I already told you that the brain responds to this. At low doses, a single injection on day five into the uh, brain, and these animals in adulthood show all kinds of neurochemical changes, and they're hyperactive. And on learning experiments, they show learning impairments and uh, high rates of anxiety and greater tendency to addictiveness to uh, drugs such as morphine and amphetamine, they are a neurological nightmare. Um, and so uh, another thing that people are concerned about is obesity. Well, bisphenol A at a very low dose in the mouse stimulates an insulin secretion from pancreatic beta cells. And then very shortly uh, after, after a few days of exposure, the animals begin to become insulin resistant and diabetic. Uh, not so great. And what we had shown previously is that a very, very low dose of bisphenol A administered during pregnancy accelerated postnatal growth. And we're looking at this as a developmental obesogen, that bisphenol A is actually possibly contributing to the increase in obesity today. Uh, and um, which obviously is a concern. Uh, it also led to early puberty in those females. So, you know, you really come back to this question, are all of these animal research uh, experiments really relevant to humans? And how does this relate to human health trends? So this comes to the issue of plausibility. Is it plausible that uh, these things that I've just shown you uh, could cause harm that, and is anything going on in the human population that would be suggestive that, you know, the kinds of things I just told you should be things humans are worried about. Well, these are published human health trends. Uh, obesity is considered an epidemic. Uh, incidents of miscarriage are going up, but there's, that's very complicated. Women are older, and, and so this has been a very difficult thing to get a handle on. There are a lot of people who think attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is occurring more now than it used to. Early sexual maturation, breast budding, uh, pubic hair development, there's every reason to think that's occurring at younger age, uh, that sperm count is decreasing. The incidence of prostate and breast cancer is clearly on age-adjusted basis going up, and CDC data are that hypospadias occurs. All of these are caused in research experiments by this one chemical, okay? Now, obviously, bisphenol A isn't the only estrogenic chemical out there, so whenever you're administering a 
product to a person, you're adding to the burden of estrogenic pesticides and other endocrine disrupting chemicals that interact with this chemical. Clearly, this is not the only chemical that can do this. It just happens to be one of the highest volume chemicals in the world and used in so many products that more than any other chemical, there is worldwide exposure to this. What do you think uh, <laughs> chemical industry has to say about this? Well, this is their response. Mind you, I just showed you a lot of peer-reviewed published studies from some of the you know, people at uh, major universities, highly respected leaders in their fields. But this is what the American Chemistry Council wrote to the California legislature that tried to ban some of these, that bisphenol A and baby products last year. And basically they say, in repeated studies in independent laboratories, the vast majority of the data show no low dose effects. Well, is that true? Yes, if they fund the study, 100% of them show not only no low dose data, they don't even show acute toxicity at high doses. I mean, their studies say this chemical, you could you know, drink it instead of martinis at night and you'd just be fine, it wouldn't do anything to you. But if you actually look at government funded studies, you see a phenomenally different outcome. And if you take out one type of animal that turns out to be extremely insensitive to this, there are only four animal studies left that actually didn't show effects of bisphenol A. So you have a staggering refutation of what the chemical industry just put down in writing under penalty of perjury, <laughs> which of course nothing happens about. Um, and then in addition to this, there are 180 studies of molecular mechanisms, uh, many of which the kind of studies we do in cell culture uh, and looking at epigenetic and other kinds of molecular mechanisms. Uh, so, um, you know, you have a really substantial literature about the harm of this. So how do chemical industries go about coming up with negative results? What do they do? I mean, they're phenomenally clever. I mean, you have to really give them credit. They're not dumb. So here's this study published by, out of the Japanese uh, National Institutes of Health. And here's the control level of sperm production in their adult rats. And then they're giving these adult rats increasing doses over a very wide range, bisphenol A, for only six days. And then they're looking at daily sperm production by the testes. They're seeing if they can, this estrogenic chemical will interfere with them. And the stars indicate that this chemical industry got the same rat, got exactly the same food. This guy works at Zeneca, uh, and uh, now known as Syngenta, and uh, then tested the same doses, and obviously, when he administered these doses, he got exactly the same sperm count as was seen in the Japanese group at the same doses. But here are the untreated animals. And what you have is a massively contaminated experiment. The untreated animals are maximally suppressed even before they start the experiment. They've already got a highly contaminated laboratory. It's just classic contamination. That is, your control animals are already maximally contaminated with some kind of chemical that does the same thing. I mean, this is, you know, I mean, this is instantly obvious, and I actually published a review of a whole bunch of industry studies, and they didn't respond at all. I actually went to a meeting and presented that in front of this guy, Ashby, and he just sat there. And this is because what is interesting about bisphenol A, it doesn't totally kill the testy. It knocks out about 40 to 50% of the sperm production, and then it leaves the rest of the cells alone. We don't quite know how it does that. But this is what Ashby actually published in his statement. As obvious as what happened is to anybody who looks at the data, he said, we're completely baffled by this. He says, I'm not, <laughs> uh, you know. Um, and there is a really great article by David Mark Michaels, a former uh, administrator at the uh, Atomic Energy Agency, and basically took this from a tobacco company suit where through freedom of information, a whole bunch of information was obtained from R.J. Reynolds and 
um, other tobacco companies. And one of the lawyers had written, doubt is our product in a memo, basically saying, our job is to go out, buy scientists, pay them to write articles that say tobacco is safe, and publish those articles. And by doing that, we will create uncertainty in the scientific literature. And we can use that in court to argue that there's scientific controversy. All right? And, it's, and he's got a zillion examples in there. And then, as part of the suit over Teflon, uh, this paper, this letter from this product protection firm, that was the product protection firm used by the tobacco industry to lead their second hand smoke is safe campaign in the 90s uh, when they were fighting the EPA rules because they realized that all over the United States, towns and in our city, for instance, is smoke free city, uh, that this would happen eventually. And so they were trying to convince the public that this uh, smoking was safe. The Weinberg Group was the product protection firm that worked for the tobacco industry. And they sent a letter to DuPont saying, we will protect you from the EPA suit about Teflon. Because DuPont in 1980 had evidence that it killed fetus. It also killed birds in your home if you heat it up. Anybody who uses Teflon should re read this on the environmental working groups website about it. Um, and uh, one of the things that the Weinberg Group wrote in, in this letter was that, you know, basically they would make sure, they, their focus would be on going out and getting the scientific findings that the company needed to protect its product, their product protection firms. And uh, in fact, DuPont hired them to do that. And if you log on to the American Chemistry Council's website, it is the Weinberg Group that has written everything about bisphenol A that is posted on their website and uh, coordinated the studies that were done. Why did they do this? Because our wonderful EPA and our wonderful FDA, our protectors, look at this and hug the chemical industry guys and say, thank you. We don't have to do anything. This is what the FDA official, George Pauly, responsible for taking care of these issues for the FDA said, and that is, well, yeah, there are some reports, not 150, some, uh, stating that bisphenol A has estrogenic activity. But there are other reports that dispute this. Of course, they practically all come from the chemical industry. But that doesn't mean anything to him. And then he went on to basically say, we approved this under the, in 1963, at a time when there were no data under generally regarded as safe. That is, we don't really think about it, just like was talked about with fluoride. Um, and we're unaware of, and they went on to say, we're unaware of anything since that time that would make us change our mind. Um, right now, the centers, the National Toxicology Program put together uh, a panel to look into the safety of bisphenol A. They were given 746 published articles to review in two and a half days. And the panel was put together by a company outsourced by the National Toxicology Program called Sciences International, whose other clients include the American Chemistry Council, Dow, and other manufacturers of bisphenol A. And when the Los Angeles Times, with a little help from some friends, uh, got a hold of the information that Sciences International was in fact really biased, uh, demonstrated bias here, uh, the National Toxicology Program had to pull them. And then they had to essentially say to the panel, this report is so biased and so flawed that you can't possibly reach a conclusion. Also, Sciences International picked that panel, and not one person on the panel had any background in studying this chemical. So, and then the people on the panel told me, not only that, they weren't given articles to review that were even in the areas that they had expertise in. So what you had was a corrupt process from beginning to end 
run by our government agency. And uh, there is help going to be to pay for that because few people in Congress, uh, like Waxman and Boxer, are a little upset about this. Um, and they should be, and the public should be. So what is interesting is if you look at things like adult exposure to this, and I'll just end up with this, you see that there are a whole bunch of studies that are implicating abnormalities in lots of different systems. And these are to what we call low doses. These are doses that are putting into animals' bodies amounts lower than what is in the average human. And developmental studies, there's just a staggering amount of information that during prenatal, early neonatal, or in childhood periods uh, of development, you have just a dramatic set of abnormalities. So what's interesting is the American Dental Institute and the National Institute of Environmental Health Sciences gave me a fair amount of money to get 40 experts a couple months ago uh, together at NIH. And they came up with consensus documents. These have been submitted to the journal Reproductive Toxicology, uh, going to be published as a symposium report. And this is just an example. This group of people came up with consensus statements of uh, their concerns uh, and basically had the consensus that they were confident that things like testicular function, female reproductive system, uh, abnormalities of the prostate and things, that there, there was a really substantial, cohesive, uh, replicated literature out there that there should be concern. And uh, the last speaker just gave you some information about the precautionary principle which basically says, you know, if there are adverse effects in animals and there's significant human exposure and nobody can deny that, and there are alternatives to products that release a lot of this chemical, why continue to use a product that could clearly potentially contribute to a, uh, adverse outcomes? And part of the precautionary principle is scientific certainty is not needed. And there is no way to do studies in human children. What internal review board would ever approve a study looking at metabolism of BPA in a newborn baby or a pregnant female or a child? I mean, who wants to volunteer your child for a randomized case control study, <laughs> given what I've just told you? I don't think so. Uh, they hung people at Nuremberg for doing that kind of thing, and for good reason. So, you know, we're not going to get these kinds of data from humans very easily, and particularly from children that are having these sealants put in their mouths during times of development. So, I guess we'll end up with, you know, you people as people out there in the world where you're using these materials, have to ask yourself, you know, based on this kind of information, is there reason for you to be concerned? And uh, particularly, you know, how, how much do you accept that given the information we have from animals and the consistency of the response mechanisms across all different vertebrates, including mice and humans, you know, should we be concern based on the animal experiments. And I have a lot of colleagues and students that contributed to this. We have a website where I maintain on that website uh, every article that's published on bisphenol A and it's abstract and it's divided up into different segments uh, including dental seal in, uh, information and uh, animal and in vitro and leaching studies. And there is a general website, environmentalhealthnews.org, that is just a phenomenal resource for uh, information about endocrine-disrupting chemicals. Thanks. <laughs>